welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Jerry and Carol Harris Jewish Destiny Series. I am your host, Rabbi Pemchus Landis, and let's delve right in and learn some Jewish history together. So, as we concluded last week, we talked about the yeshiva movement, and how the yeshiva started in Velazhen and in Preshburg, and the concept spreads throughout Europe. Just on the tails of that, we have another movement start really alongside the yeshivas, but it'll be absorbed into the yeshiva movement. And that is the Musser movement. Now, the Musser movement was formulated by one of the great men of our history, whose name was Riv Yisrael Salanter. That's how we recall him. He was Riv Yisrael from the town of Salant in Lithuania. Uh, his full name was Yisrael Benzev Wolf Lipkin. And he is going to be the one to conceptualize the Muslim movement and make the revolution that it makes in the Jewish world. To summarize what he was trying to do, he is quoted as saying that the reform movement came to reform Judaism, but Musser came to reform Jews. In other words, the concepts came from essentially listening to the complaints of reform and Haskalah on the traditional community. You know, there were certain complaints that they made that while they were made in a very vindictive, virulent way, some of them were valid. There were definitely situations of the rabbis being influenced by the upper class, of the, of the hamonam, sort of the rank and file of the observant community, not being concerned with how they acted, with how they looked, with how they dressed, with, with their hygiene or whatever it was. There were some of these things that might have been somewhat valid. So Rivisol Salanter, in part, understood those as valid concerns, and essentially, and making the Muslim movement would take the wind out of the sail of Haskalah in Russia, because Russia was because uh, uh, Haskalah is coming along to create the new Jew, whereas Musser was going to correct all of their complaints on the Jewish community, but within the framework of Torah and within the framework of our tradition, as opposed to abandoning our tradition. Now, Rav Yisrael Salanter's main influence of the start of the movement was a one of the Gedolian, one of the great men of our history, whose name was Rav Yosef Zundel of Salant, who was a disciple of Onagon, and he was a man who was very cautious to keep his greatness, so to speak, under a wrap. Uh, he never wanted people to know uh, his, his righteousness, his greatness, and therefore what he would often do is he would take long walks off into the woods, and when he was in the woods, that's where he would do a lot of his meditate, meditating, his praying, his, his attempting to uh, connect to the Almighty, and Rav Yisrael Lipkin became, became, so to speak, aware of the greatness, or, or suspect, we should say, of the greatness of Rav Yosef Zundel, and therefore he would often follow him on these walks. And there was one time when he was following him and he was hiding and observing what, uh, what Rav Zundel was doing, and uh, Rav Zundel caught him. And he is quoted as saying to Rav Yisrael, he says, if you want to be a great Jew, first you must be a God-fearing Jew. And Rav, uh, Rav Zundel Salantz became really his, his teacher in that idea, that it is very important not only to be a scholar, because we know throughout history there are many, many Jews who are great scholars, know a lot of Talmud, know, you know, can, can, give a, can give a lecture on the highest level, but their, their, personal, uh, their personal midos, their personal character attributes are just nothing to be admired. So Rav Zundel tells the young Rav Yisrael, he says, if you want to be great, you must be a God-fearing Jew. You can't just have the scholarship, you have to be a mensch, so to speak. And this is really was the creation of the concept of Musser. So, you know, you would think at a certain level it's common sense, and we're going to see that's part of the opposition to Musser, is, is, is those, there were those who thought it should have been common sense, but bottom line is, it wasn't common sense. It needed to be focused on at this point in the 19th century and European Jewry. Now, Yisrael was a great genius. He was known as a great scholar from a young age, definitely one of our great prodigies, great minds of, of, uh, of Jewish history. In fact, the story is told that, uh, you know, what, what is common today in the yeshivas, and it was, or, or not even in yeshivas, when, when big scholars come to give a class, or definitely in the yeshivas, that there's a concept of what's called marmakomos, meaning the sources that are going to be used for the lecture are often posted beforehand. And the idea is people can prepare the sources, and therefore they're not, so to speak, walking into the lecture blind. So someone once wanted to play a trick on Rav Yisrael Salanter, probably one of the masculine, wanted to make him look bad. So they removed the sources that he had posted before one of his lectures, and, and put up a, a list of sources that 
had nothing to do with anything. Right? They were totally random. And uh, so not only were they not the sources he posted, but they were sources that were, you know, trying to find the connection from A to B and B to C was impossible. And the story is told that Rabbi Yisrael came in, took one look at the Marmacomas, and gave a very, you know, beautiful Lumdisha lecture based on the sources that were posted. Um, again, don't know if the story is true or not, but one thing I know is they're not telling that type of story about you and me. That just shows the great mind that he had. And, and he utilized this mind to promote his movement. Now, he knew that if he went around just talking about the need for Jews to, uh, to uh, you know, behave better and, and, and to uh, you know, treat everyone equally and, and you know, the, 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 fo- the ethical focuses of Musser, uh, he knew he wouldn't get a hearing. So what he would do is he would go from town to town giving these, these tremendous uh, scholarly lectures, and in the last five to ten minutes, he would slip in ideas of Musser. And that's how he slowly but surely uh, started to gain momentum for his concept of the Musser movement. And, and this, is, this is where it started. This is where it started. It was a Jewish community that uh, you know, was fractured, was splintered with Haskalah on one end, uh, the Hasidim and Misnagdim, you know, many, many fights. And Rabbi Yisrael was coming in to bring the ethical, uh, essentially bring out the ethical undertones that are present in Torah, that have always been present in Torah, and to make them a true focus of the Jewish community. Now, the way that he did this is he established houses of Musser in different communities. And the idea was that people would come there to study these philosophical concepts of Musser, but they would also see the people who were practicing ethical lives, and they would learn to emulate them. And, and that was really the concept of the, uh, the house of Musser, the base Musser, uh, as it became known. And the focus was not only on, on man-to-man. Again, man-to-man, Ben Amal Chaver was a big focus, but it was also Ben Amal Lamakom. Uh, Musa really stressed uh, having a true, like, like Rav Zundel told Rav Yisrael, you have to fear Hashem. You have to have a true fear and awe of Hashem. And that was also worked on in these houses of Musa. Now, Rav Yisrael's main house of Musa was established in Vilna. That's where he lived. He was originally from the town of Salant, but he lived at this point in Vilna, which was the center of Lithuanian Jewry. And he meant for it to be a movement of the masses. And in Vilna, it truly became a movement of the masses. It became something that, that everyone was involved with. It became uh, very popular and widespread. But unfortunately, because of that, we're going to see it, it gains the attention of the, uh, the Maskilim, and, and, uh, and uh, it's going to come into a little bit of trouble. There's a, there's a famous quote. There was supposedly a discussion between Rav Yisrael Salanter and the Tzemach Tzedek, uh, I believe the, the thir- second or third Lubavitcher Rebbe, and, in which... Uh, you know, there's different ways of telling the story depending on which side of the fence you're on. But basically, Rav Yisrael Salanter uh, came to say that he wanted to do for the Misnagdim what the Hasidus did for the Hasidim. In other words, put that life back into Jewish observance. And, and therefore, there's going to be a lot of similarities between Musser and Hasidus. Um, it's going to, in certain ways, uh, rely heavily on Kabbalistic thought. Um, in a different way than Hasidus does, but it's still going to be present in the uh, in the Muslim movement. The great Muslim, the great teachers of Muslim are many times going to be great. Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalist. And, uh, and uh, anyhow, so in Vilna, where, where Rav Yisrael Salanter was, the success was tangible. The whole town was said to be different uh, once Musser took hold. And it was, uh, it was really something special, as is recorded. Now, Rav Yisrael Salanter, in many ways, rehabilitated Rav Moshe Chaim Lazato, the Ramchal, who we spoke about a number of lectures ago, who is definitely one of the great men of our history, who was not appreciated in his time. Uh, now, one person who did appreciate him in his time was the Vilna Gon. The Vilna Gon himself said about the book, Mesil Sisharim, The Path of the Just, that, uh, that in the first ten chapters, he did not find one superfluous word in the whole book. Uh, but be it as it may, we, we discussed before, the Ramchal met a lot of opposition in his time, but in many ways, he's now rehabilitated rehabilitated by the Muslim movement, and that work, the Mesil Sisharim, the Path of the Just, becomes one of the Bibles, if you will, of the Muslim movement. It becomes main, one of the main works of the Muslim movement, as it, as it really is until today, and in, in, the, uh, in the yeshivas where there's a focus of Musar. Uh, Mesil Sisharim is still very much a, a uh, bedrock or cornerstone of the movement. Now, it's interesting that one of the other main books that Rav Yisrael Salanter would use in the House of Musar was a book by the name of Cheshbon Hanefesh, which means, uh, so to speak, a an account of your soul. And the author of this book was a man named Rabbi Nachem Mendel uh, of Satanov, 
Lappin. Lappin was his last name. And uh, what's interesting is, according to most accounts, he was a Moskil. He was part of the Haskolo movement. And uh, not only that, but this book was really based on the writings of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, now, Benjamin Franklin did not live that, that much of an ethical life himself, but he did. He was a great eth ethicist, at least on the philosophical level. It just didn't necessarily permeate into his uh, into his lifestyle, into his life. But uh, but it's it, it said, or it's, it's known that, that Menachem Mendel of uh, of used the writings and the influence of Benjamin uh, of Benjamin Franklin when he wrote the book Cheshbon and Nefesh, and that also becomes one of the bedrock cornerstone books of the Muslim movement, uh, and, and uh, is, is identified as such by Rivi R R Um Again, I have the question in my mind of if he was a Moskil, which was really the enemy, why Rivi was using his book, but it must be that the writings were so in line with what Rivi was trying to do, that even though the source was not, so to speak, from an ally, it was uh, the, the text was nonetheless very very helpful and very useful, and it's still printed today as one of the great classical works of Musar, um, the, the book Cheshman and Nefesh. So it's interesting, when you're learning Cheshman and Nefesh, in many ways you're learning the, the philosophies of Benjamin Franklin, and, and in so doing, Benjamin Franklin, it, you know, at one level becomes Jewish. <laughs> so um, anyhow, so, so when things like this were going on, uh, Musar was, so to speak, attacking or tackling some of the same problems as, as Haskala, and they had other incidents like the one I just quoted, and the Masculine thought they had an ally in Rivia Salanter. So much so that in 1848, the Tsarist government created the Vilna Rabbinical School and Teacher Seminary. I think we mentioned this last week as well, but uh, the goal was not, so to speak, to develop Jewish leaders. <laughs> the goal was to develop leaders who would help the Jews to assimilate into the Russian culture. And therefore, it was not meant to be in any way, shape, or form a place to promote uh, traditional Jewish values or Torah learning or Moser or anything of the like. Uh, but the uh, but the, the Maskilim really wanted Rav Yisrael Salanter to be the head of this institution. And of course, he avoided it like the plague uh, until the point where the, as we said last week, the Maskilim often were in cahoots with the Russian government. So the uh, the Maskilim went to the, the Tsarist government and, and told them that uh, Yisrael Salanter had to be the head of this new seminary. And, uh, and when Rav Yisrael found out about that, he fled from Vilna. He didn't want to have any part of it because, you know, if the Tsar tells you to do it, you're not going to have much of a choice. So he fled Vilna for Kovna. Uh, uh, Kovna was another major city in Lithuania, and uh, and he and he continues the Muslim movement there. Now, unlike in Vilna, where it was uh, it was a, a populist movement, in many ways in Kovna it becomes an elitist movement, and uh, and we're going to see that one of the things that that Rav Yisrael does in Kovna is he establishes the Kovna Koilo, which becomes really the central institution of the uh, of Musar, and and it'll develop the future leaders of Musar. Now, just to show one last anecdote to show you what type of personality Rav Yisrael was, there's a famous story told that there was once a cholera ec epidemic that, that broke out, and uh, and the fear was that, uh, or the, the doctor said that you're on Yom Kippur, the Jews should really eat, or needed to eat on Yom Kippur, because it was dangerous for them to fast with uh, with this cholera epidemic. And Rav Yisrael was, uh, Rav Yisrael Salant was worried that people would be, uh, you know, firmer than that, would be more pious than what the doctors would say. So on Yom Kippur, he gets up in the synagogue, he makes kid and he and he continues to eat as if to say, well, if, if the rub's eating, then no one's gonna have a problem with it. But he knew that there's a chance that people wouldn't do what they needed to for their health. So therefore, he, he made a kiddush and shul on Yom Kippur that year. Now, when we look at the students of Rav Yisrael, the main students, uh, his his main disciple was a rav by the name of, of Rav Yitzchak Blazer, or often known to us as Rav Itzel Petterberger. He's known as Rav Itzel Petterberger because he becomes the rav in Saint Petersburg, and uh, we're gonna see him many ways, he uh, will, will take the torch after Rav Yisrael Salanta passes away. In fact, the main work we have of Rav Yisrael Salanta was a posthumous work written by Rav Itzla Petterberger, uh, the Or Yisrael, which is one of the main works of the writings or the ideas of Rav Yisrael Salanta. Another one of his main students was, was Rav Natalia Amsterdam, uh, Rav Laser Gordon, the founder of the Telz Yeshiva, who we addressed last week, for those of us here in Cleveland. Uh, that's uh, where the, uh, the Yeshiva here in town, the Telz Yeshiva, is the descendant of that Yeshiva. Uh, Rav Yaakov Yosef. Rav Yaakov Yosef was the first and only chief rabbi of New York who had a terrible, terrible life after coming to the States and becoming the chief rabbi of New York. Uh, terrible life. In fact, after about a decade, they stopped paying him his salary. And uh, and, and uh, if, if his life wasn't terrible and, and, and tumultuous 
in life, even in death. In his funeral, there's uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people turned out for his funeral in New York, and, and, and a riot actually broke out. Some of the local non-Jews, uh, you know, instigated a riot, and uh, you know, a person had a very difficult life. But he was one of the main students also of Yisrael Salanter. And uh, then we have Reb Simcha Zisl Ziv, who is known as the Altar of Kelm. Not to be confused, by the, by the way, with Chelm, that silly, like, uh, folklore or whatever city in, uh, in, 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 in Jewish, whatever, Jewish culture, um, but, uh, but Chelm in Lithuania, and he made an institution, also an institution of Musser in 1860, called the Chelm Talmud Torah, uh, which, was, uh, which was very revolutionary in its time, uh, really going in the, in the approach of Musser and Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. But beyond that, he, uh, in sort of seeing what happened to some of the other yeshivas, he made a curriculum of secular studies. that They spent three hours a day on math, geography, Russian language, and literature, and uh, it was a, a revolutionary approach to the approach of the yeshivas, which was not that old at this point, all right? The yeshivas are only about 50 years old, and here he makes this Kelm Talmud Torah in Lithuania with secular studies to try and push off the, the, the Russian government, so to speak. Now, it's interesting, again, for us here in Cleveland, is with Simcha Zissel um, had, a, had a student, I'm sorry, his, his son, who took over for him, was Rav Nachum Zev Ziv. Um, that's, who, that's who took over for, uh, for Simcha Zissel Ziv. And then after Rav Nachum Zev Ziv passed away, his student, Rav Reuven Dov Dessler, took, away, uh, took over for him. Um, and uh, he was a student of Rav Nachum Zev. And then Rav Reuven Dov Dessler had a son by the name of Eliyahu Eliezer Dessler, who was the great Michtam Eliyahu. And uh, Rav Elio Dessler had a son named after his father's Rebbe, uh, Rav Nachum Zeb Dessler, who was the founder of the Hebrew Academy of Cleveland. And he had three sons, Ruven Dov Dessler, Simcha Zissel Dessler, and Elio Eliezer Dessler, named for all these people we just mentioned. And they are the ones really running the Hebrew Academy today, uh, Hebrew Academy of Cleveland. Uh, but that's the, uh, the history of their family and, uh, and really coming from the great Kelm uh, Talmud Torah. And um, now, now, just to, to finish off of Israel's life, he had a very tragic life in many ways. He ended up leaving Lithuania towards the end of his life. It's, it's unclear as to why. He, he, uh, he passed away in, in, uh, in an area in, on, in the German Rhineland, and, uh, and he had a son. And he, had, he had children who did go in his way, but he had a son that, uh, that did not go in his, in his approach. Uh, one of his sons was Revyomtov Lippmann. Rav Yom Tov Lippmann, uh, who was a great uh, mathematician and uh, had totally abandoned traditional Judaism. And it was interesting, he got some sort of award, I guess the equivalent of a Nobel, Nobel Academic Prize in his time. And the Maskelim and the newspapers wrote this article of how proud the great Rav Rav Yisrael Salanter must be of his son, Rav Yom Tov, for getting this, this math award that no Jew has ever gotten before. And uh, Rav Yisrael, in response, took out from his own funds, took an ad in that newspaper basically saying that uh, that uh, he was not happy with the situation with his son. He wishes his son would return to tr traditional Judaism, and if anyone would help him in that regard, he would be forever obliged to them. Uh, Needless to say, his son never uh, came back, so to speak, but it does show you kind of the, uh, again, the character of the times we're dealing with and the, and the personality we're dealing with. Now, it's interesting that uh, the Rav Yisrael Salant is one of the first people ever to write about the conscious of the, uh, the, the, the concept of the conscious and the subconscious. It appeared in his writings uh, a while before they appeared in uh, in Freud's writings. So now I'm not saying that Freud stole it from Yisrael Salanter, but but really the first person ever to record concepts of the conscious and the subconscious, to our knowledge, was not Sigmund Freud, but was actually Yisrael Salanter. Now, the Muslim movement, like anything new, had a tremendous opposition, but because of the greatness of Yisrael Salanter during his life, it was dormant. It, 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 was, it was not a war, it was not a battle, it was very dormant. But after he passes away, essentially from 1875 until the onset of World War I, uh, which brought about really the destruction of the European Jewish community in many ways, uh, that's when we have the war of, uh, of Musser. And the issues with Musser were essentially that, again, there was something new, uh, that it would, people were worried that it, was, it would take away from the supremacy of Torah learning, that it was only focusing on this one little aspect of Torah learning, and that it would take away from the, the vastness of Torah learning 
learning. And then beyond that, that uh, that, that amongst in the Muslim yeshivas uh, in the the pushing of being a, really a mensch, uh, there were, you know there was a big focus on dress and looks and looking clean and wearing the latest fashion. Uh, to really just to, that just to look like a mensch, that a representative of Torah should look like a mensch. As I learned from one of my teachers, uh, my one of my closest teachers as a child, Rav Benjamin Friedman Shlita, that that I was once helping him put up his sukkah. I was home from yeshiva uh, right before the sukkah's holiday, and I was helping him put up his sukkah. And we had to go to Home Depot for uh, for whatever we needed. And and he rolls down his shirt sleeves, puts his tie and his jacket back on, and we get in the car to go go to Home Depot. And I said to him, Rebbe, like. We're just going to Home Depot. Why are you putting your, your tie and jacket back on to go to Home Depot? And he said that I have the Michael Jordan philosophy of life. And that is that Michael Jordan was, uh, was quoted as saying that he would always put on a suit to walk from the hotel to the team bus because that might be people's only opportunity in the world to ever see Michael Jordan. So he said this might be their only opportunity, opportunity to see a from Jew, to see a religious Jew. And I want to give them a good representation. And that was, uh, that was a focus of most. So a lot of times the students of the Muslim yeshivas were called dandies and they would dress in very, very fancy clothing. And, uh, and, and, and that brought a little bit of an ire for the people uh, sort of in the, in the greater community. So after Visual passes away, we see the war really come to the surface. And in this time, we had a number of Jewish newspapers in the, in the Russian Empire. Uh, two of the most famous were one called Hamelits. By the way, they were written in Hebrew. And the other one was, uh, uh, was Hatsfira, or the Siren. Um, and, and a lot of these, would, uh, these polemics would be written back and forth, uh, really against uh, whatever the war was at the time in the Jewish community, so to speak. It took place in these newspapers. So the, the, uh, the war for, in the Muslim movement will take place really back and forth in articles and these newspapers. Uh, not a very pretty time for the Jewish people, but not unlike a lot of things we have to deal with uh, throughout Jewish history. Now, we mentioned before the Kavna Kolel that Rav Yisrael Salanter started when he, when he moved to, uh, when he moved to Kavna. We moved from Vilna to Kavna. And when he started the Kavna Kolel, he really created the idea of the, the institution or, or really, really, um, an institution of married students, which exists until today, and really the concept of paying those students, because once you get married, you have more expenses, you don't have your family to rely upon in any way. So this was the first ever uh, kolel to give uh, the, the younger light, to give the members of the kolel a stipend. And uh, after he passes away, the Rav of Kovna takes over, Rav Yitzchak Elchanan Specter, who was also, again, one of the great men of Jewish history. He becomes the, the head of the Kovna Kailo, and it's, it's supported as many of these shivas at this time by a man by the name of uh, Rav Avadi Lachman, who is one of the wealthy Jews in Lithuania, who, so, who really supported the, a lot of the yeshivas, uh, and he supports the Kovna Kailo, and he's going to support a lot of the other yeshivas. And then, eventually, Rav Yitzchak Elchanan turns the Kailo over to Rav Yitzchak Blazer of Itzla Petterberger, one of the, the, we mentioned before, one of the main disciples of the of uh, Rav Yisrael Salanter, and at that point, it really becomes the uh, institution of Musar. It becomes the central uh, institution for the Musar movement, and we're going to see that uh, the Rav Yitzchak Blazer will really will really develop an institution that will develop the future leaders of the Musar movement. One of those leaders is a man by the name of Rav Nussan Tzvi Finkel. Not to be confused with the Mir Rosh Hashiva, who passed away about uh, fifteen years ago or so, or 10 years ago or so. Uh, he was a, a named for the Rav Nussan. He was a descendant, and, and uh, I think a, a lateral descendant, uh, but, but named for Rav Yisrael, uh, Rav Nussan Svi Finkel. Uh, Rav Nussan Svi Finkel is, becomes a, um, a student of the Kovna Kailo and ends up building an offshoot yeshiva of the Kovna Kailo in a suburb, in really the Jewish suburb, but, uh, the exclusively Jewish suburb of Kovna known as Slabodka. Now, Slabodka is a small village that doesn't appear on any map but Jewish maps, because it is really going to be the capital of, of, of the Jewish world because Lithuania is really the capital of, uh, I'm sorry, Kovno is really the capital of Lithuania and Slobodka is the Jewish suburb and it becomes really the capital of Jewish Lithuania um, alongside with, with Vilna. And he, he founds the Slobodka Yeshiva. And the yeshiva was uh, was named actually for the great Kovna Rov, who we just mentioned, Rav Yitzchak Elchan Inspector, and it was named Knesset Beis Yitzchak, and it was an offshoot of the of the Kovna Kailo. and uh, it was technically illegal according to Russian standards, and therefore when these fights break out, not only between like the Maskilim and the in the in the Frum community, but even within the Frum community, uh, the the fights about the Muslim movement, that issue of the Slobodki yeshiva technically being an underground yeshiva, technically being illegal, is is going to be used against the yeshiva. Um, now, 
because it was an offshoot of uh, an offshoot of the Kav Nikolo, it of course becomes one of the great Musa Yeshivas. Now, the only problem was, as Rav Yisrael, as Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel was leading the Yeshiva, now he was not technically the Rosh Yeshiva, he's what they called the altar. As, as we mentioned before, Rav Simcha Zissel was called the altar of Kelm. That was a term given to the, what we now call, nowadays the Meshkiach, but really the, the head of the Musa of the Yeshiva, essentially. Uh, so, Rav Moshe Mordechai Epstein was the Rosh Yeshiva, and and Rav and Rav Nassim Tzvi was the altar of Slobodka, was the like the, the what we call it nowadays the Mishkiach, the, the the dean of men, if you will, and and the war within the community, uh, so to speak, against Musser was coming to a head at this point, and uh, even though in many ways uh, the the altar of Slobodka, Rav Nassim Tzvi Vinkov really built the uh, yeshiva into a major place, he is basically thrown out uh, once because of this war, and uh, and what's he doing? he's thrown out. He goes basically across the street and he builds a new yeshiva with, with a handful of his students who follow him. And this yeshiva is called Knesset Beis Yisrael, uh, named after Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. So here we have two of the great yeshivas in Europe, but they're literally right across the street from each other in Slobodka. Um, now, when the war of Musr is eventually put down a little while later, we're going to see that even Knesset Beis Yitzchak ends up adopting a lot of the concepts of Musr. And, uh, and at the onset of World War of World War One, the uh, the yeshiva Knesset Beis Yitzchak will run to the town of Kamenetz and henceforth be known as the Kamenetz Yeshiva, with the great Rosh Yeshiva Rav Baruch Ber Lebovitz, and uh, they'll start a whole network of Kamenetz Yeshivas when they when they move to, to Israel with their own form of Musar. Uh, but uh, Rav, Yisrael, uh, Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel moves across the street, starts the yeshiva Knesset Beis Yisrael, and really that is the yeshiva that will rebuild Judaism after. After World War II, um, we're going to see that he is—he's going to end up going to the land of Israel and, and starting a branch in the land of Israel in the, in the 30s, but uh, but not before creating the men who will rebuild Torah Jewry after World War II. So just out of, even though we had many institutions in in, in 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 Lithuania at this point, and many of them recreate are recreated after the war, like we mentioned Tells, we mentioned um, we mentioned the Mir. Uh, these are these are going to be recreated or are going to survive the war. In some way, shape, or form, and be recreated at first in America and in Israel. Uh, but but the men who will rebuild Torah Jewry after after. Um after the war are the students of the Alto of Slobodka, and they are. Rav Lezer, uh, Rav Lezer Yehuda Finkel, uh, he was his son, and he ends up being aligned with the, with the Mir Yeshiva, and will help to rebuild the Mir Yeshiva, go with the Mir Yeshiva to Shanghai, and then uh, to America, and then ultimately in Israel. And uh, Rav Yitzchak Hutner, the great Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Zabir Nechaim Berlin, in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, who was Rosh Yeshiva Torah Vadas, the father of Shmuel uh, Kamenetsky, grandfather of Shalom Kamenetsky of the Philadelphia Yeshiva, uh, Rav Ram Elio Kaplan of the Hildesheimer uh, Seminary, and it was built in Germany, Rav Aaron Cutler of, uh, of Base Marriage Gavoa in Lakewood, uh, Rav David Leibowitz of the Chavetz Chaim Yeshiva system, and uh, Rav Yaakov Yitzchak Ruderman, who was the founding Rosh Yeshiva of my Yeshiva in Eretz in Baltimore, uh, Rav Yecheskel Sarna, who will go with the altar to Israel to head the Hebron Yeshiva, uh, Rav Isaac Sher, uh, who, who will head the uh, Rav Yitzchak Isaac Sher who had the, the branch of the Sabadki Yeshiva in Bnei Brak and uh, Rav Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg the Sri Yesh who will also be part of the Hildesheimer Rabbinical Seminary in Berlin so all of these are some of the students of, of the Alta Sabadka and they're really the men for the most part who will rebuild Torah Jewry after World War II after the destruction of, and the annihilation of European Jewry so, um, so as we look at just sort of to sum up with the Muslim movement like any movement it had its challenges in the beginning uh, it was not accepted easily, but but with the by the time World War One will roll around and the yeshivas have to go underground, have to run away from the uh, from the fronts of the war, and many of the yeshivas will find a way to sort of uh, rebuild and thrive in between the wars, and then for the most part, have to flee or be ultimately destroyed at the time of World War Two. But the by 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 World War One, the concepts of Musser will be 
will be part of the yeshivas, but, but you know, I would say a watered-down version uh, to the point where today in, in many of the Lithuanian yeshivas, the, uh, you know, you have after, like in my yeshiva, after mincha every day, after the afternoon service, we'd have a half an hour of what they call Musr Seder, where we were supposed to be learning works of Musr. And, um, you know, so the whole movement gets boiled down to a half an hour a day on the yeshiva schedule, but hey, it's better than nothing. Now, one of the other opponents of the Musr movement at the time was the uh, the offshoot of the Velazhina yeshiva, the Brisker yeshivas. Uh, Rav Chaim Brisker, we mentioned that last week, and and they will they will oppose uh, the Muslim movement again because the concept of. It's all Torah. We don't need to focus on one point more than the other. And it's uh, it's so much so that today with the network of brisk yeshivas that exists throughout the world, mainly in Israel, is that they are still, I think, the only one of the Lithuanian-style yeshivas that don't have any type of Musr Shmuz, uh, which is a Musr discourse, or a Musr Seder, where you'd spend, like I said, half an hour a day studying Musr. Nope. They say it is in the words of the Talmud, words of the Torah. We don't need to separate it out. Uh, but that's the Muslim movement. And in many ways, it, it hijacks whatever was okay or good about Haskalah, similar to Rosham Shmuel for Hirsch did in Germany against reform. It'll take the valid points of Haskalah, but put them in a Torah framework that'll help to really, uh, really be embraced by the Lithuanian yeshivas and make a different style of yeshiva. And that is the Muslim movement. I thank you so much for joining us tonight. I thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to joining and continuing with you again next week. Thank you so much.